This episode is brought to you by Choiceology, an original podcast from Charles Schwab. Hosted by Katie Milkman, an award-winning behavioral scientist and author of the best-selling book, How to Change, Choiceology is a show about the psychology and economics behind our decisions. Hear true stories from Nobel laureates, authors, athletes, and more about why we do the things we do. Listen to Choiceology at schwab.com slash podcast or wherever you listen. The rules that people are asking for are not partisan rules. They're rules that would apply to all judges, no matter who appointed them, no matter which president chose them, or whether Leonard Leo had anything to do with their selection. These are rules that apply to everyone. Hi, and welcome back to Amicus. This is Slate's podcast about the courts and the Supreme Court and the rule of law. I'm Dahlia Lithwick. That's my beat at Slate. And I don't know about you, but I don't think I've ever seen more drama around the highest court of the land than I have seen in these last few weeks. And this week, we have had yet more revelations about judicial failures to disclose matters pertaining to their personal finances and, oh, secret spousal income. And of course, we had a Senate Judiciary Committee hearing that probed this question of ethics rules for the justices. The danger isn't that rogue justices are operating without ethics. It's that Democrats aren't winning every fight and they find that reality intolerable. I've been disappointed by Supreme Court opinions, too. But my Democratic colleagues should fill out a hurt feelings report and move on for the sake of the Constitution. Later on in the show, Slate's very own Mark Joseph Stern will stop by to talk about some of the issues that also bubbled over this week, including the possibility that the era of Chevron deference is over, meaning that courts may need no longer defer to agency interpretations of their own rules. That segment is available only to our Slate Plus members. If you would like to join their sparkling ranks and get access to all of Slate's shows ad-free and never hit a paywall on Slate.com, and also get access to exclusive content like my chats with Mark, please go to slate.com slash amicus plus to sign up. That's slate.com slash amicus plus. And to our Slate Plus members, thank you not only for your sparkle, but for supporting the work that we do here at Slate. But first, we are all drowning in a soup of Supreme Court news all day, every day, changing by the hour. And it's become all but impossible to parse out what is a forest and what is a tree, what is an ethical scandal and what's a legal scandal, or why Justice Samuel Alito continues to think that maybe it's kind of bad to be left to bleed out in a Texas parking lot before you can be given medical treatment, but it is much worse when people criticize the Supreme Court. Now, I confess, even I have lost the threads of this huge, big Stringboard in the sky. And when I try to tot up how to connect Leonard Leo's bottomless slush funds to Harlan Crow's rental fees for judicial friendship, to the fact that the justices cannot seemingly be bothered to create an ethics code to apply to themselves, much less adhere to it, it's really quite a lot. And, and, As we hit record on this week's episode, news was dropping from ProPublica of Clarence and Ginny Thomas's undisclosed, naturally, arrangement for Harlan Crow to pay hefty private school fees for a grandnephew they said they were raising like a son. As we hit record on this week's episode, news was dropping from ProPublica of Clarence and Ginny Thomas's undisclosed, naturally, arrangement for billionaire Harlan Crow to pay hefty private school fees for the grandnephew they said they were raising like a son. Then, after we taped, more news. Late Thursday, we learned, by way of the Washington Post, that in 2012, Leonard Leo had funneled thousands of dollars to Ginny Thomas by way of then-pollster Kellyanne Conway. As Leo, who had the money billed to an organization called the Judicial Education Project, with which he was affiliated, was very careful to tell Conway the paperwork should have, quote, No mention of Ginny, of course. The Judicial Education Project filed an amicus brief in the Shelby County case a few months later, 
That case was decided 5-4 with Clarence Thomas in the majority deciding to eviscerate the Voting Rights Act. Hey, it's Harlan Crow and Leonard Leo's world. We all just get to live here. We all get to live with what feels like the twin inevitabilities of more ethics scandals and a Supreme Court with no evident interest in doing anything about them. Thankfully, we have Lisa Graves here to parse woods from trees and untangle this string board, and I could not be more here for it. Lisa Graves created True North Research and is its executive director and editor-in-chief. She has spearheaded several major breakthrough investigations into those distorting American democracy and public policy including CokeDocs.org. Lisa Graves served as Deputy Assistant Attorney General in the Office of Legal Policy at the Justice Department in the Clinton administration, Chief Counsel for Nominations for Senator Patrick Leahy on the Senate Judiciary Committee, Deputy Chief of the Article III Judges Division of the Administrative Office of the U.S. Courts, and as an adjunct law professor at George Washington University Law School. In 2018, Lisa helped shape the national conversation around the Brett Kavanaugh nomination. I spoke to Lisa after the Harlan Crow boarding school beneficence news had dropped, but before we got the details of the Leonard Leo, don't mention Ginny, Washington Post news. Lisa Graves, I guess I'm just going to say I have been waiting to have this conversation with you for like at least 100 days, maybe 100 years. Welcome to Amicus. Thank you so much for having me on, Dahlia. I'm such a fan of your work and so deeply appreciative of the work of Slate and also their help in really breaking part of that story around Kavanaugh by publishing my essay about Kavanaugh. And so I'm um, just an honor to be on your show and grateful to have the chance to talk with you about these horrible and really important issues. So as I've suggested, Lisa, I think part of the problem we're having now is we're just kind of in this food processor where there's like a million things happening at once. And it's very hard, even for me, to keep it all straight and maybe even harder to connect these like atomized pieces of things that feel like corruption and influence and democracy suppression, how to connect them to each other. So I know that's like a great big task, but I thought maybe we start with the newest things first and stipulate there will be new things after this conversation. At the end of the week this week, ProPublica reported that over several years, our friend, the Republican mega donor Harlan Crow, actually paid for Clarence Thomas's teenage grandnephew, who uh, Clarence Thomas was his legal guardian, he paid his school tuition to a private boarding school and to the school that he attended prior. And needless to say, Justice Thomas didn't disclose these payments. As the story noted, he did disclose a gift for his grandnephew's education in 2002. He clearly knew this is a thing he had to do. So these undisclosed gifts from the dear, dear friend that happens to be a millionaire that happens to have, you know, amicus briefs and cases before the court, it starts to look really normal. Maybe this is just how justices roll. So I think my first question is, why is it that we don't like multimillionaire friends of Supreme Court justices funding their lifestyles, their trips, their travel, and seemingly their ward's tuition? Well, that's a great question, and that really is the big question. It's because we in America favor and believe that we should have a fair and independent judiciary. And I think that the code of conduct for United States judges that applies to every other judge in the federal system other than the U.S. Supreme Court really makes it clear, and I'm just going to quote from them because it's just so well put. They say, an independent and honorable judiciary is indispensable to justice in our society. A judge should maintain and enforce high standards of conduct and should personally observe those standards so that the integrity and independence of the judiciary may be preserved. And it goes on to say, a judge should not allow family, social, political, financial, or other relationships to influence judicial conduct or judgment. And a judge should not lend the prestige of the judicial office to advance the private interests of the judge or others, or nor convey or permit others to convey that impression that they are in a special position to influence that judge. And I think this really goes to the standard that applies to all judges in America, apparently, except for in any enforceable way to the Supreme Court, which is that 
this creates an appearance of bias, an appearance of impropriety. And I think reasonable people uh, across the country, people from both parties, all parties, no parties, on hearing Clarence Thomas's relationship with Crow, the trips, the tuition, and more, are rightfully shocked that any Supreme Court justice, let alone a judge on any court, would engage in such behavior. And Lisa, I guess I want to turn to, and we heard this a lot at the hearings this past week, that the twin claims that Justice Thomas has used to defend himself are, but he's super, super really good tight besties with the crows, so that makes it okay. And also that somebody told him early in his career he doesn't need to disclose the stuff. Do either of those two claims solve the problem you just raised? I just want to point out for listeners, Justice Abe Fortas resigned for taking, what, $15,000 to give some lectures at a college? Yeah, I mean, it's astonishing. I'll take the, the latter part first, which is for Clarence Thomas to assert that people told him he didn't have to disclose this, I think he should have to respond under oath, under penalty of perjury, and name each and every person in government or out of government who told him that he did not have to provide public disclosure of these sorts of gifts, particularly the gift of travel on private jets, on uh, Harlan Crow's luxury yacht, because thousands of people employed by the federal government routinely follow those rules. The rules allow for personal hospitality of a close friend, which is described in the statute and the notes or instructions for complying with that statute as, you know, a meal, like a birthday meal from a friend or a small gift, but not travel. Private travel, private jets, private yachts are not considered to be, quote, gifts of hospitality like a dinner. And of course they're not. Of course they're not. They're extremely valuable. And as ProPublica's reporters noted, one of the trips alone, the travel alone, flying on private jets to New Zealand, having a private yacht curried over to New Zealand and used by Thomas at Crow's behest, was worth at least $500,000. That's just one of the trips, the many luxury trips that Thomas got or received from Harlan Crow. And in fact, our understanding from the reporting is that it's been routine for Thomas to fly on Harlan Crow's private jet. These are gifts, they're valuable gifts, and they really put a stain on the court and on the integrity of the court. On the first question you pose, this question of, uh, which is related to that, which is, you know, we're just friends. You know, they're not just friends. And if you believe that they are sort of best friends and so that doesn't matter, then let's look at the cases pending before the court this term. Right now, there are three cases where the Manhattan Institute has submitted amicus briefs to this Supreme Court, including the student debt case. Kathy Crow, said now to be one of Clarence Thomas and Jenny Thomas's best friends, is a trustee of the Manhattan Institute. So basically, she's a funder and a director of the Manhattan Institute. Has Clarence Thomas recused from the cases involving the amicus brief submitted by his best friend? No. Or his best friends? No. And so I think there are a lot of issues at stake here, including what's been uncovered about Harlan Crow's own businesses before the court. But it's also the case that Harlan Crow isn't just a billionaire. He's a billionaire who has spent a lot of money trying to influence law in this country and influence who wins offices, including who gets on the Supreme Court. In fact, Harlan Crow was a donor to one of the groups that helped spend money to get John Roberts and Samuel Alito onto the Supreme Court back during the Bush administration. So he has a deep and intense interest, it seems, in what's happening with this court and who is on the court. And now he's been spending years rewarding someone on the court, Clarence Thomas and Jenny Thomas. And we're going to take a quick break to hear from our sponsors. This episode is brought to you by Choiceology, an original podcast from Charles Schwab. Choiceology is a show all about the psychology and economics behind our decisions. Each episode shares the latest research in behavioral science and dives into questions like, can we learn to make smarter decisions? Or what is the power of negative thinking? The show is hosted by Katie Milkman. She's an award-winning behavioral scientist, professor at the Wharton School, and author of the best-selling book, How to Change. In each episode, Katie talks to authors, athletes, Nobel laureates, and more about why we make irrational choices and how we can make better ones. Choiceology is out now. Listen and subscribe at schwab.com slash podcast or find it wherever you listen.
We're going to pause now to hear from one of our great sponsors, Talkify. Are you having a hard time meeting good people to date? Why do you keep trying the same methods over and over if you know you're set up to fail? It's time to say goodbye to swiping and bring back the human touch to dating with Talkify. Talkify is the country's number one modern matchmaking service that is designed to help you achieve relationship success. Their trusted compatibility specialists hand select successful and compelling candidates so that you can date consciously and productively. Here's how it works. The Talkify matchmakers meet with you to learn about what you're looking for in a partner. Then they'll select and screen potential match candidates for you, doing background checks, video interviews, and asking the tough questions that are too awkward for first dates. From there, your matchmaker plans your date introductions and handles all communications for you, creating a safe and stress-free dating experience. And right now, Talkify is offering our listeners 20% off when you become a client at Talkify.com slash amicus. That's T-A-W-K-I-F-Y dot com slash amicus for 20% off when you become a client. Talkify.com slash amicus. And now let's return to our conversation with Lisa Graves. One more piece of this and then I want to turn to this kind of sprawling machinery that you're you're flicking at here, Lisa, which is this is part of a juggernaut that isn't just about friendship. It's about changing the composition of the court and, in fact, changing the nature of democracy. But I do have to point out to uh, uh, listeners that Mark Pauletta tweeted in defense of Clarence Thomas very much in the key of what, again, we heard at the hearing and we've been hearing from Justice Thomas's, which is, you know, this is predatory. It's going after the grandnephew. It's, you know, why sweep this innocent kid into this, you know, evil gotcha campaign? The fact that the Thomases are so generous is really, you know, being punished here. And I just want to flag or let you flag that Mark Paletta, who is defending Clarence Thomas on Thursday morning, is not just a good friend of the Thomases. He's also a Thomas biographer. He's involved in making the sort of hagiographic documentary of Thomas. He's Ginny Thomas's lawyer on January 6th issues. He testified before the House Judiciary Committee about why there should be no ethics rules. And Lisa, he's in the picture. <laughs> he's in the picture with Harlan Crow and Leonard Leo and Clarence Thomas. This It feels to me this tweet is actually the smoking gun here about why nobody is just friends in this situation. Well, it is really stunning. We found that photo last year when we were looking into the Kadanji Brown Jackson nomination. If you'll bear with me for a moment, the reason we were looking into that was because um, Judicial Crisis Network, which is a long time sort of tool that Leonard Leo has deployed, it announced it was going to spend $1.5 million on that Kadanji Brown Jackson nomination to try to stop her. When the ads came out, the ad was basically Kadanji Brown Jackson doesn't like Thomas, but Thomas is great. He's so great. Here's a biopic. It, it's basically the link to the biopic. So we looked into the biopic and we found that the biopic where Clarence Thomas says on tape that he prefers the Walmart parking lot to beaches for his RV was actually underwritten by Harlan Crow and others. And we, in looking for photos of Harlan Crow with Thomas, found that photo of the painting that we didn't know was actually hanging on the wall of Harlan Crow's estate as ProPublica uncovered. But what that painting that's been seen or that photo that's been seen around the world shows is Harlan Crow with Clarence Thomas, with Leonard Leo, with Mark Paoletta, and also Bo Rutledge. But Mark Paoletta, as you point out, And Paoletta is someone who has, as you said, been a defender of Thomas from the get-go. I read his tweet this week, and, you know, one of the things that struck me is that, first of all, as the ProPublica reporters note, Thomas previously disclosed gifts of tuition until it came to Harlan Crow, so he hid that. Second of all, Paoletta refers to a particular clause within the rules regarding gifts, 
Another part of that set of rules involves whether you declare someone to be a dependent on your taxes. And we haven't seen Clarence Thomas's taxes to know whether he declared his nephew who was living with him, who Paoletta says he was spending a lot of money on, was declared as a dependent. But even regardless of that, this goes the appearance of impropriety. This is tuition that costs $75,000 a year. Most Americans could not afford that tuition. Clarence Thomas could, in part because of the money that he receives as a Supreme Court justice and the money his wife has received from sort of undisclosed true donors that have funded her pay from the right-wing infrastructure, but they chose not to. They chose to have Harlan Crow pay for that child's tuition. And the other part of, of Paoletta's claim, which I personally, in my opinion, consider to be missing the mark at, at most generous, which is if you give a gift to someone, usually they know they got a gift. And it's clear from the story that the nephew had no idea that he had received, quote, a gift from Harlan Crow. But you know who did receive that gift, the benefit of that gift? Clarence Thomas and Jenny Thomas, because they didn't have to spend the money to pay for the private school tuition for their nephew. There's somebody else in the painting (laughs) and in the picture of the painting, (laughs) and that's Leonard Leo. And I'd love to talk about him because he's also in the news this week. Um, And I'd love to talk about him because, again, it's always cast as the, like, what is your problem, Lisa? This is a benign debate society. And Leonard Leo is just, you know, overseeing, like, a really important stew of thought and debate. And please stop saying that. That he is, you know, the mastermind of some larger plot. But like we again learned this week that Leonard Leo is again part of this pipeline between the Federalist Society and big donors and their efforts to, as you've said, reshape the courts. Is this another one of those places where it's just drip, 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 drip? You know, Leonard Leo got a one point six billion (laughs) dollar donation, the biggest such donation. Like, is this just of a piece with we're just okay with this or How is it different, the news of what Leo involves himself in and the revelations that this is whatever else he is overseeing? It's just not a debate society. Well, that's a great question. And the story in Politico was very revealing. There's been a series of major breakthrough investigations, including that original Washington Post investigation by Bob O'Hara and Sean Boberg in May of 2019 that first really unmasked the the initial scope of money that had been raised with Leonard Leo at the center of it to help capture the U.S. Supreme Court and other courts and reshape the law and basically roll back our rights, perhaps a century of precedence, as we're, you know, certainly beginning to see. The story about the Federal Society is one of sort of optics and reality, which is to say, you know, at the law school level, they do host debates. That is true. But the real operational function of the Federal Society within the right wing network is the operational um, imperative that their leaders described in a 1987 story by the New York Times in which they basically said in 1987, the group had been founded just a few years earlier, but they said that within a decade, they anticipated their people being in key positions in all branches of government, that that was their objective. And Leonard Leo has been the key operator in that objective of of identifying people to help push into positions of power, including on the Supreme Court, but not only on the Supreme Court, also attorneys general of the state, the state attorneys general, where we know now from filings that are filed with the IRS for a particular type of group, a 527 organization. But um, we know that RAGA, the Republican Attorneys General Association, has had a lot of donors over the years. One of those donors that has given more than $2 million since 2014 is Coke Industries. But you know who gave more? Judicial Crisis Network and its successor entity, the Concord Fund. And that's Leonard Leo's operation. So the biggest funder of the Republicans Attorney General is the operation that's tied to Leo. And it's interesting because reporters have documented that that's a pay-to-play organization. If you give $15,000 to Raga, you get this much access to AGs. If you give $150,000, you get this much access. And then it says for $250,000, details are available upon request. So, you know, what kind of access, what kind of influence does Leonard Leo have for that amount of money? It's extraordinary. And as uh, the New York Times and ProPublica covered last year, uh, as you said, there there was a $1.6 million 
billion, sorry, $1.6 billion gift to Leo to basically give him a trust fund, make him a trust fund baby in the biggest such gift in history to allow him to direct money to try to influence American society, to to reshape it, to fit his worldview. And his worldview, in my view, is is extremely regressive. But I don't think it's just, I don't think we should accept it as just the status quo, as just the way it is or the way it ought to be or the way it naturally should be. It's not. This is an extraordinary influence network, network of influence. It's having a profound effect on our court. In my view, it's wrong. And it is really damaging to our democracy. Well, I mean, I think you're starting to lay out the map of the world and to connect the dots. And so this is really important. And and, and what you are starting to say is, I think the piece of it that we don't see, because we keep being told, look at the tip of the iceberg. And the piece of it is, as you said, funding think tanks, funding universities, funding amicus briefs, right, that go before the court, you know, campaigns, uh, judicial campaigns, not just for the Supreme Court, but judicial campaigns for state Supreme Courts and other races. And then a move in, again, another, you know, there's this shell game where you have different organizations that have different names. uh, So it looks like it's not all connected up and all this dark money that we can't quite trace. But it does end in efforts at vote suppression, too, right? And also efforts at, at pushing things, as you said, like the independent state legislature theory and democracy suppression. So just... Say what you want about that, but I think it's really important to say this isn't just Coke Industries, this isn't just Harlan Crow, this isn't just Leonard Leo. This is part of an orchestrated, concerted scheme, not just to take over the courts, as you said, but to then use the courts to achieve certain pro-business, anti-union, you know, anti-democracy ends. That's exactly right. And we helped document how Leonard Leo was involved in amicus briefs and basically um, helping to direct money to uh, support amicus briefs uh, for really uh, important landmark cases where precedents were reversed. And we helped document that money flow through the Bradley Foundation into other, you know, arms of uh, Leo's network. And, you know, Senator Whitehouse has just done a tremendous job of uncloaking this through his books and his presentation, for example, at the nomination hearing on Amy Coney Barrett's nomination to the court, talking about this flotilla of amicus. And it sounds like Latin, (laughs) just like the name of your show. It is Latin. But it's uh, not just being a friend of the court. In some ways, it's being a very close friend of the court because, Basically, what we're seeing is some of the very same groups that help push some of these very controversial judges onto the court, uh, the Trump nominees in particular, then turn around and file briefs asking those judges to rule in favor. And not just to rule in their favor in terms of affirming precedent, but actually to adopt radical changes, to invent theories, basically, to, to adopt an invented theories, one of which is the theory that they launched last year in the West Virginia versus EPA case, where they said that there's a, a major questions doctrine, it's not a doctrine, it's an invention, that they decided meant that they could set aside the very detailed rules by the experts at the EPA regarding clean power plants and how to try to mitigate the devastating climate changes underway. You know, I've read the Constitution cover to cover many times, and I'll tell you what, uh, major questions isn't in there. Neither is the independent state legislature theory that they're considering right now, which is a shocking, a shocking, not doctrine, shocking theory that has never been part of the law in the United States, that there have been binding law. It's a theory, and it's one that basically says, in this one area of our law involving uh, map drawing, courts have no role. This comes on the heels of a decision just a few years ago where the U.S. Supreme Court, when Justice Kennedy was on the court, when Judge Kennedy was there, they basically declined federal jurisdiction over some of these types of cases. But they said, of course, that could be litigated in the state courts. And now this Supreme Court, with a change in personnel orchestrated by Leonard Leo has decided it's going to take on the question of whether they can remove courts from having jurisdiction over these incredibly disproportionate, unrepresentative maps that are the maps that help determine who controls the state legislatures and also ultimately who controls the federal legislature, Congress. And so it's extraordinarily troubling, but not just that. As you mentioned, Dahlia, we also know that one of the, quote, fictional names that one of the Leo Tide groups operates under is called the, quote, Honest Elections Project. 
that is a spin in my view, because that group has been devoted to trying to make it harder for Americans to vote. They've adopted the legal agenda of Trump's mantra that the election was stolen or that a democracy was stolen or that the votes were stolen and and that they say that they're trying to make it harder to cheat and easier to vote. They're not trying to make it easier to vote. And in fact, there's no documented statistical evidence that there's any sort of voter fraud that has resulted in any difference in the presidential election or other elections. But the Leo Tide, quote, Honest Elections Project has been working in tandem with a lot of these other right-wing groups that are very, very partisan, very tied to sort of the Cleta Mitchells of the world, who's now in the news again for her targeting of college campuses and trying to limit voting on college campuses. This group is very tied to that whole operation. So Leonard Leo is someone who is not just the co-chair of the Federal Society and formerly the vice president of the Federal Society, but he's someone who is playing a key role in supporting groups that are targeting our democracy in ways that really are changing the structure of our democracy or aim to, in, in my view, make minority rule possible. And now let's take a short break. Hey, Amicus listeners, I wanted to give you a heads up about an exciting upcoming live event that we're doing. On Wednesday, May 24th, Mark Joseph Stern and I will be live in Washington, D.C. to talk about this Supreme Court term, the blockbuster decisions headed our way, the institution of the court itself, and how we as journalists can meet this moment. We are putting together an incredible roster of special guests. And for those who'd like to go all out on the event, there will be a happy hour before where you can meet me and Mark. I don't promise we're going to be happy. And some of our colleagues get more information at slate.com slash live. And we will also link to it in our show notes. We'd love to see you there. And Slate Plus members will get a special discount on tickets. You can find member event discount codes by signing into Slate and visiting your account. Hey, Prime members, did you know you could be listening to this episode and all episodes of Amicus with Dahlia Lithwick ad-free? Avoid the ads and start listening today by downloading the Amazon Music app. Sometimes the news is funny, but most of the time it's not. If you've reached your doom ceiling, listen to Crooked Media's Hysteria for unapologetically real and opinionated conversations about the news you need to hear. Every week, Hysteria, hosted by Aaron Ryan and Alyssa Mastromonaco, is leading the charge alongside a hilarious and relatable squad of bicoastal women. With their fresh take on the political and cultural landscape, Hysteria is breaking down barriers and changing the game. Say goodbye to the male gaze and hello to smart, real, and refreshing content. Tune in for new episodes every Thursday, wherever you get your podcasts. More now with Lisa Graves. Before I turn to ethics reform, I want to turn to this one paradox is that everything you just said, the plan was a plan and it's working exactly as intended. When you say it, they say that, you know, we're a bunch of paranoid conspiracy theorists. But weirdly, uh, folks in FedSoc brag about it behind closed doors to their donors. So I just want to play you a little bit of audio. Leonard Leo in the audio from 2019 that was obtained by the Washington Post. Here he is speaking to members of the Council for National Policy. I think we stand at, uh, at the threshold of an exciting moment uh, in our republic. Uh, the revival of our structural constitution by the U.S. Supreme Court. A revival in those very important principles of limited constitutional government, separation of powers, federalism, enumerated powers, limits on judicial power, sovereignty. And um, this is really, I think, at least in recent memory, a newfound embrace of limited uh, constitutional government in, in our in our country. I don't think this has really happened since probably the, before the New Deal, which means No one in this room has probably experienced the kind of transformation that I think we are beginning to see. We're not there yet, but we're beginning to see it. If we're saying that they did this and they're saying that they did this, why is there a dispute about what they did? 
Yeah, it's a, it really is a paradox. And and I, I don't know, they haven't called me a conspiracy theorist to my face, but, you know, I am a person who is just grounded in the facts. And what the facts show is is what they admit, which is that this is their determination to put these people on the court in order to enact a revolution or revival uh, in our law of of what they call the structural constitution, which is an invented term again, but really goes back to a notion of extraordinary limits on the federal government back to before the New Deal. And that's, for the, the lawyers in the audience, that's the Lochner era. It's an era where judges were intervening to protect businesses in response to Democratic movements trying to protect, you know, against child labor. I can't believe that's back in the news, by the way. But um, child labor, um, working conditions, unsafe working environments, as well as trying to advance the plain language of the 14th Amendment, that it guarantees equal protection of the law. And we had such a severe long-standing crisis in America in terms of the Jim Crow laws that denied that, denied that equal protection of the law. And so anyone who wants to take us back to before that New Deal era, to that era of the law, is really truly mounting the most regressive agenda I could imagine for America. And an agenda, quite frankly, that doesn't fit the needs of this century, of the 21st century, when we need government to do good, to be able to respond to climate change, for example, and to be able to enforce our voting rights, which are under attack, and which, by the way, John Roberts was central to decimating our ability to defend those voting rights. I want to correct myself. You are quite right. Um, I was projecting there. It's not you that they call conspiracy theorists. Uh, Judge uh, William Pryor, speaking at the Federalist Society, actually called me and Rick Hassan conspiracy theorists for pointing some of this out. So that was just rank projection. And I apologize. I want to turn, if we could, Lisa, to the ethics hearing that happened in the Judiciary Committee in the Senate this week and to ask you if any part of that hearing was a surprise. We heard a lot of sort of distraction and deflection about, you know, RBG took trips too, and, you know, you're only mad because the plan is working and why we bought the court. Why can't we just keep it? Is there anything that you heard at that hearing that was shocking and arresting? And maybe the, the, the follow-up question is, do you have a sense that anything that happened at that hearing is moving the public to see that this has to be top of mind? Well, I, I mean, I was shocked that Michael Mukasey said that he would not decline a trip worth $500,000 because it might cause him to offend a friend. That's not the standard for the federal judiciary when he was in it and since he's been out of it. That's never been the standard. The standard is one of appearance of impropriety or actual impropriety. And it's one that clearly is not binding on this Supreme Court. But that was shocking. The Sturm and Drang by the Republicans on the committee was not shocking in the sense that it was fully anticipated. But, you know, it, it's amazing to me how willing they are to bend over backwards to defend Thomas at any cost, including the cost of the integrity of the U.S. Supreme Court. This is an issue that should be bipartisan, nonpartisan. The rules that people are asking for are not partisan rules. There are rules that would apply to all judges, no matter who appointed them, no matter which president chose them or whether Leonard Leo had anything to do with their selection. These are rules that apply to everyone. And so I really, at the root of it, uh, in particular, think that John Roberts is a failure, that the result of that hearing, his failure to appear, is just one of his many failures. He has failed to do anything in response to revelation after revelation about Clarence Thomas's gifts. The first revelation was before he became a chief justice back in 2004 with David Savage of the Los Angeles Times. But there was a major revelation with Mike McIntyre in 2011 and other revelations around Jenny's income as well. And Roberts has done nothing. And in fact, you can see the contrast because when there was a leak of a draft opinion, Roberts sprang into action and said there was going to be a, a full investigation. I'm not sure it was entirely full investigation since the justices weren't put under oath in their answers. But nevertheless, there was an investigation and we see no signs whatsoever of any investigation of Thomas's actions or the actions of other justices. And instead, what we see is, is Roberts appending to his letter a statement signed by all the justices claiming that they themselves comply with the rules regarding gifts or disclosure, when in fact, the manifest evidence, the unequivocal evidence in the public record now from these investigations is they don't. And so we have a chief justice whose primary job or chief judge on the court, whose primary job is to protect the integrity of the courts. 
And he has failed to do so. And in fact, he's tried to thwart every effort to have a binding code or for Congress to try to intervene in the face of his failure. And can you give us a second on uh, not just the thwarting, but I think the conflating of this conversation, these critiques, the sort of uh, mounting evidence of really shocking failures of disclosure with uh, claims by uh, both Justice Alito last week in his interview with The Wall Street Journal, but also the chief justice in his State of the Judiciary report that somehow criticism of judicial conduct amounts to threats on their lives, that this is an effort not just to undermine the integrity of the court, but to make the justices targets of violence. I mean, it it feels like that has to be the shabbiest reason for not acting that you could imagine. But yet, I think we heard it again and again and again at the hearing that this is just because, you know, liberals are grumpy and they want attacks on Justice Kavanaugh's family to continue. I mean, it's it's so offensive, quite frankly. It's just morally offensive for the chief justice to make those assertions and for Alito, whose comments don't shock me anymore, given what he's said and done in different fora. But the fact is, is that, that that's absurd. The public officials in Congress who are trying to address this severe crisis have the opposite desire. They don't want anyone to be harmed or hurt. And I think the American people as a whole don't want that either. And the idea that if you disclose that you're getting a gift from a billionaire, if you are required to disclose a gift from a billionaire, therefore the people who who want that disclosed means that they want you to be assassinated is absurd and outrageous. The people who want those matters disclosed are the American people who think we should have a fair judiciary and judges should have to disclose those sorts of things. And disclosing them is not about trying to target them for harm. And to try to make that argument is what it's one of the most sort of uh, serious and deceptive and deliberately, I think, uh, misdirecting types of comments I've ever seen come out of any sitting federal judge ever. I think those claims must be condemned as politically manipulative. And for them to come from the chief justice and for it from a sitting justice is just abhorrent. And I also abhor anyone who would seek to assassinate any member of the court or Congress. And we've seen an assassination attempt in full bloom this past year with the attack on Nancy Pelosi's husband um, and also with the January 6th effort to try to catch Pelosi and Pence. And so we've seen political violence being pursued with our own eyes. But to try to equate mere disclosure rules that every other court needs to follow with some sort of conspiracy to assassinate them is pernicious and outrageous And I think that the the attempts to make those claims should be condemned no matter who makes them. And let's also note, and Mark Stern and I wrote this a few weeks ago, but it certainly dovetails with uh, Justice Thomas, at least, and his longstanding doctrinal abhorrence of disclosure, right? He's been taking this position for years and years that to be forced to disclose anything is to invite violence and harassment. So in some sense, what he is doing now is perfectly in keeping with his view of the world. Um, I wish we had known that when he was sworn in, because if he didn't believe in disclosure, it would have been useful to find out at his hearings. I I don't want to let you go without asking you to tie this whole sucker in a ribbon, which you have done so well. But I think we are looking down the barrel, Lisa, of an end of term that people are not fully prepared for. I think in the next few weeks, we are going to see, unless I am sorely mistaken, the court acting to reverse precedent in some cases in dramatic ways on affirmative action, on uh, debt relief for college loans, on the Indian Child Welfare Act, on civil rights protections for LGBTQ Americans, and on the voting rights. I think this is going to be a big, big honking term. And I wonder if you can help me think through this question of, does that have anything to do with the conversation we just had. How are critiques of judicial misconduct and ethics and disclosure different from or somehow connected to massive, massive shifts in doctrine that are about to befall us? And how do we think about our critiques of Dobbs and Bruin and, you know, the the EPA case you described as either part of or separate from critiques of judicial behavior? 
Well, I guess two things. So one is that it's certainly the case that we are going to see some terrible activist extremist decisions coming from the right-wing faction that now dominates our Supreme Court. These uh, decisions to come, I anticipate, as you said, will reverse precedent, will change the rules on a host of issues, merely because there are different judges on the court, which is sort of the antithesis of the whole notion of precedent, that there should be continuity in the law, that there should be stability in the law, and it shouldn't just change because Amy Coney Barrett, for example, gets confirmed one month before a presidential election and is, it enables them to enact this extreme agenda. But second, it is inextricably tied to what we've been talking about, because what we're really talking about is this plan to capture the U.S. Supreme Court, to install people on it who are sure things, you know, not to choose people because they have a reputation for being fair or we think they might be fair, but because the people who are at the decision-making table, Leonard Leo, who chose the judges that Trump chose from, believes that they will be sure votes. That's my opinion. That's why they were chosen, so that they could enact this revolution, this uh, change in the law that he has boasted about at the Council on National Policy and in other settings. And so this is what they want. What they want is to use the court to roll back our rights. They show no signs of stopping, even with the revelations. But my hope is that not only do people clearly understand what the court is doing, and there certainly was a public reaction to Dobbs in terms of what happened in Kansas, what happened in the midterms, what happened in Wisconsin in the Supreme Court race in a state that Leonard Leo has paid a lot of attention to over the last decade in terms of its Supreme Court and other matters. But we are seeing this revolution that Leonard Leo has put in place. It's one that the American people didn't ask for, didn't give consent to, weren't informed that this was why these judges were chosen. In fact, they were said to be judges who are, quote, rule of law judges. That's the language that they use. Their definition of rule of law is not the same as I think most people's, which is, you know, following precedent, respecting those rules. Instead, their definition of rule of law appears to be to change the law to be what they rule, in essence, to rule, to reverse precedents that people rely upon, and also to make new law, to change the rules on religion, to inject more religion into our public schools, for example, to try to kill off efforts to address some of the structural racism that no one who is a reasonable student of history could deny, to even try to cut off the president's power to address the debt crisis that so many students have faced, a debt crisis that there's certainly ample executive authority to address. But we have a court that seems to be very beholden to the right-wing political agenda, to the GOP agenda, and more than that, to Leonard Leo's personal agenda, as he's articulated it or he, as he's advanced it through the various organs um, or entities that he has helped lead or fund. Oh, Lisa Graves created True North Research and is its executive director and editor-in-chief. She has spearheaded major breakthrough investigations into those who distort American democracy and public policy. She has served as Deputy Assistant Attorney General in the Office of Legal Policy at the Justice Department. She served as Chief Counsel for nominations for Senator Pat Leahy on the U.S. Senate Judiciary Committee and as an adjunct law professor at George Washington University Law School. Lisa, I cannot, cannot thank you enough for absolutely putting the pieces of this jigsaw puzzle, this ever-expanding jigsaw puzzle, together for us so clearly and so passionately. Thank you for your work. Oh, it's an honor to be on your show, Dahlia. Thank you so much for inviting me. And that is a wrap for this episode of Amicus. Thank you so much for listening in. And thank you so very much for your letters, your questions. You can always keep in touch at amicus at slate.com. You can find us at facebook.com slash amicus podcast. Today's show was produced by Sarah Birmingham. Alicia Montgomery is executive producer of podcasts at Slate. And Ben Richmond is our senior director of operations. We will be back with another episode of Amicus in just one week, a live show we're taping this weekend at the Crosscut Festival in Seattle with the Brennan Center's amazing Michael Waldman. We're going to talk about all the ways in which the Supreme Court has come to divide America. So if you're in Seattle, I'll see you there. If not, until next week, take good care. Good care.